The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship today. Today we're celebrating the Epiphany, the visit of the wise men to Jesus. And you might be saying, why is that Christmas tree still up? Well, the Christmas tree is still up because we're still in the season of Christmas tide. And in Christian homes, it's actually tradition to leave up the Christmas tree until Epiphany. Now, today's January 3rd, and if you've already put your tree away, that's fine, good on you. But Epiphany actually falls on January 6th. We just celebrated on the closest Sunday. And so if you haven't put your tree away yet, like us and like the church, you have all the way until the 6th and you don't have to feel lazy about it. So that's why we have the tree up today. I'd like to invite you as you're gathering to um, put in the chat if you're on Facebook and you're watching this at 10 a.m. on January 3rd, to put in the chat something that you hope for, for 2021. Now I know we all have some big things that we're hoping for that will change in 2021, but put something small, something that you're hopeful for, something small for 2021. And while you're doing that, I want to tell you about our guest preacher today. My good friend Joe Webb is going to be preaching for us. Joe is a clergy person in the United Methodist Church in West Virginia, and he is a phenomenal human and a good friend. He's preached for us a few times before at Avery when we've worshipped together in person, and so I invited him to come back again today and help us celebrate the Epiphany. Joe is a pretty interesting guy. He's got an interesting ministry. He does a couple of different things. In the Parkersburg area, he's got a ministry called New Wineskins, and that's a group of people who gather. It's a pub theology kind of thing. So they gather at a Marietta Brewing Company, and they sit around and talk theology and have a pint when people meet in person. Right now, they're virtual. He also has a wonderful podcast called Accidental Tomatoes, Finding Faith Beyond the Fences. So you might want to check that out. Both of those are for people who just don't feel like they fit in the church. And um, they're both have, they both have a lot of interesting content, whether you show up and worship virtually with new wineskins or you listen to his podcast. And he also has a blog at joewebwrites.com. Now, you're not going to remember any of that all the way till the end of the service. So good luck. This is a video. You're in luck. And so you can come back right here to the beginning if you want to check those things out after the end of the service. Now I'd like to invite us to prepare for worship through music and then join together in our first hymn.
It's great to be back with you all at Avery United Methodist. I'm really sorry I can't be there with you in person, um, but I'm really excited to have the chance to um, to be part of your gathering here today and to be back with your community. Our scripture for today's Epiphany message is a familiar one uh, for the day and for the season. It is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and I'm reading today from the Common English Bible. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. They said, In Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what the prophet wrote. You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me, so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went, and look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them, until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country 
by another route. This is the word of the people of God. Thanks be to God. So full disclosure, first of all, for those of you who, who may not know me uh, as well as some others might, I, I'm, I'm not a big person for tradition. In fact, when I get the choice between doing something traditional and doing something a little more out of the box, I will almost always choose the least expected way. Maybe I'm just naturally contrarian. I don't know. I get pretty easily bored with doing the same things the same way over and over and over again. I prefer the new and the unknown to the tried and true. I'm certain that that's a character trait or maybe a character flaw that has led me to where I am in imagining and creating new types of ministries for a living. But I think that there's something in this traditional epiphany reading from Matthew 2 for this particular Epiphany Sunday that maybe we need to hear. I think maybe there's something in the particular way that Matthew addresses his audience's expectations, specifically their nationalist religious expectations, that we might need to pay attention to as we kick off 2021. But maybe it does take a non-traditional reading of this text to see that. Now, for most of us, I suspect the, the, ma the magi that Matthew tells us about, the three wise men or the three kings, depending on which tradition you subscribe to, are an integral part of the Christmas story. No nativity is complete without them, although to be accurate, the chances were pretty slim that they showed up at Jesus' birth along alongside the shepherds and the angels. But regardless, they are ingrained in our imagery of the Christmas narrative. In some ways, I think that might be fairly unfortunate. Again, maybe it's the countercultural non-traditionalist in me, but I think maybe we put ourselves on some theologically shaky ground when we get a little too close in linking the birth story, which, let's face it, we primarily get from the Gospel of Luke, as told by Linus in the Peanuts Christmas special, with Matthew's account of the visit of the Magi, which is unique to his Gospel, and which we should remember is written specifically for the Jewish community in Jerusalem that Matthew was a part of. Which brings me to a point that I think is important for us to remember one that I think may often get lost in our telling of these stories. Matthew is not narrating a historical timeline as it happens, which is the way I suspect we often read the Christmas accounts. Matthew, like the rest of us, is looking back on these events and interpreting them for his very specific audience from their very specific context. So for Matthew, this birth narrative is really the backstory for what happens next in the context of Jesus' death and resurrection and the subsequent destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. That is the reality in which his community is living and into which he's trying to interpret what happened with Jesus. And as part of that, he has to address their preconceived notions and their preconceived prejudices about what a Messiah would be and would not be so that he can help them make sense of the way the rest of the story unfolded. Matthew has to readjust his audience's expectations of what they thought the story was supposed to be so that he can explain to them how it is that Jesus really was the Messiah and what that really meant. That's partly why Matthew's revelation in reality is anything but that peaceful pastoral scene that we imagine in our nativities. This is no soothing fairy tale. If the story of Jesus' birth was subversive in its association with the poor and the marginalized, the visit of the Magi rocks the political system in Jerusalem to its core. Which, by the way, is exactly what you would have been expecting as a first century Jew living in the shadow of the Jesus event and the destruction of the temple, trying to make sense 
of why your nation still hasn't been delivered from Roman occupation. You wanted answers. And that's what Matthew is trying to deliver. But he has to do a little recalibrating first, which is what the Epiphany story is all about. Now, who exactly these mysterious travelers even were is obviously a source of great speculation. Whether or not they were actually kings or royalty in any fashion is debatable. What we do know is that for ancient pre-scientific peoples, events in the skies were believed to be associated with events on earth. Kings and queens and potentates of all kinds would certainly have had experts in their courts on how to read celestial signs to help them predict or explain natural phenomena, or even to help them gain advantage over enemies in wars. Some historians speculate that these particular men may have been from the courts of Persia, or previously Babylon, where their learning might have been handed down through many generations from the biblical hero Daniel, who as a Jew in exile interpreted dreams and events for King Nebuchadnezzar. That might explain their particular interest in a particularly Jewish, Jewish prophecy that seemed to be coming true in their time. And it's purely speculative whether or not these wise men or these magi were in fact even men. We only have the text of a patriarchal society to go by for that. But whoever they, they were and wherever they came from, the one thing that stood out to Matthew's original audience like nothing else was the fact that these people were not Jewish. In fact, to take it a step further, the practice of predicting things by the stars would have gone totally against Jewish law and tradition. That was a job that was left solely to the prophets who alone had the privilege of communicating directly with God. So if Matthew is trying to convince a Jewish audience that Jesus is the promised Messiah of the Jewish people, why would he frame this story of revelation through a group of pagan stargazers? Again, it helps us to look at the larger canvas on which Matthew is painting. And he uses one crucial phrase, I think, to help us see it. When the Magi arrive at Herod's palace in Jerusalem, by the way, where else would they go if they were seeking a new king of the Jews? Matthew tells us that Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem was troubled with him. This may be my favorite line in this entire narrative. It's, it's one of those things for, that for years I sort of kind of overlooked as, as sort of a throwaway phrase in Matthew's telling, but of course there are no wasted words here. The phrase exists because it means something. And in this case, I think it unlocks the main point of what Matthew is trying to convey. Herod's title as the king of Israel was actually more self-anointed than anything. The line of kings from David had been broken during Israel's long exile. During the early Second Temple period, Judas Maccabeus led a semi-successful revolt against the occupying forces of Alexander the Great, who were in Israel at the time. And his successors were for a short time known as kings of Israel. But by the time of Roman occupation, Herod was nothing more than a puppet ruler put in place by and for the will of Caesar. He was no more king than you or I. He had no real authority beyond that granted to him by Rome. He was nothing more or less than a figurehead. But he was a figurehead with an ego, with a sense of privilege and influence that must be protected at any cost, including murdering several members of his own family and political allies. So when the Magi come looking for a newborn ruler, probably assuming that Herod had had a son, the figurehead king panics. And a panicky pseudo-king might even be more dangerous than a panicky real king. So it's no wonder that when Herod became troubled, it was absolutely troubling for everyone in Jerusalem. 
Of course, the interesting thing in this story is that the chief priests and scribes that Matthew describes, which would have meant essentially the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the temple, seemed to know when Herod asked them about it exactly what prophecy the Magi were chasing. So either they had missed the signs altogether, which is possible, or they chose to ignore them because they didn't align with their expect expectations, which is likely, or they denied the reality of what was clearly happening because it could harm their privileged political standing, which is almost certain. Can you see what Matthew is doing here? If the biggest, if the bigger, excuse me, picture he's trying to paint is to show Israel how its perception of its own history was missing the larger point that God was trying to make. This story of three pagan Gentile astrologers revealing the identity of Messiah is one of his most brilliant strokes. Let's look at it this way. Herod is a symbol for Israel's rejection of God as the nation's true king. For generations, Israel had lost its true purpose to reveal God's loving kindness to the world through a countercultural way of living based in compassion, mercy, and restorative rather than retributive justice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Israel found itself in exile, first to Assyria and Babylon, and later as exiled in place by Greek and Roman occupations, because it had broken its covenant with God and chose to live instead like all the other nations, hungry for economic and political power and privilege. What Matthew is trying to do through this story of Jesus's birth being revealed to the Magi is to prepare his audience to understand how Jesus would become for Israel what Israel could not become for itself. That Jesus will become, as Matthew will later reveal in the Sermon on the Mount, the salt of the earth and the light of the world to fulfill Israel's true vocation to demonstrate God's way of love, justice, compassion, and mercy in contrast to the prevailing cultural values of power, privilege, violence, and domination. The epiphany that Matthew is seeking of his audience is that they will realize the folly of selling out to nationalistic, political, and religious powers rather than following the inclusive, compassionate way of Jesus, the one in whom God's very self, who has always been Israel's true king, is incarnate. We spiritualize the visit of the Magi at our own theological peril. If we miss the point, of how Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem was troubled with him. We miss the very foundation that Matthew is laying for a gospel that overturns all of Israel's expectations rooted in power and domination systems in favor of the rule of Yahweh, what Matthew refers to as the kingdom of heaven, based in Jesus's revelation of the holiness of all of God's people, as image bearers of the creator. We should all be troubled when our own agendas of privilege and influence are challenged by a call to love and protect the outcast and the oppressed, to truly see all people as equal and equally loved, and to act in this world as if we actually believe that Jesus's words are true to reject the self-centeredness of empire for the self-emptying Messiah. And that's what Christmas and Epiphany are all about, Charlie Brown. And the sky grows bright with love.
In the service, I asked you to put something in the chat that you were hopeful for, for 2021. I said that it didn't have to be big, it could be small. And something that I'm hopeful for, for 2021, is our small groups. Grown, right? Collective grown if we were worshiping at person in person at the way that I said that. Anyhow, I was part of a small group this last fall, and it was wonderful. It was so transformative for so many people. A small group is a, a group of people that's not terribly large in which you connect with one another about faith and life. Um, they'll be about eight weeks long, eight to ten weeks long, and we'll start them later this month. So if you're interested in that, send us a message through the Facebook page, or you can message me through Facebook, and we'll get you connected to a small group for a limited time for eight to ten weeks here at the beginning of the year. We'd like to invite you to make a gift to sustain our ministries. Small groups is one of those. And if you'd like to do that, you can go to our web page, uh, the donate tab on our web page, which is averyumcwv.org slash donate. We've got a couple of electronic giving platforms there and you can give that way, or there's the address to send a check to the church. Thank you so much to all of you who gave for our emergency fund over the holidays. We'll have a final total for you in worship next week, but I just want to thank everybody for your generosity, for the ways that you want to support people most in need in our community. And now, as another act of faith, let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as you go out looking for Christ in the world, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.